Welcome to Elam Lutheran Church on this, the fourth Sunday in Lent. And this day, we've got just a couple of things to make you aware of before we begin our worship. The big news is that next Sunday, the 21st of March, we will begin to have in-person worship. And that means that you can come here at 8 o'clock into the fellowship hall for worship. You can come to the sanctuary at 9.30. Couple of things to keep in mind. When you're in the sanctuary, for instance, we will be seating uh, people in every other pew. Those uh, people who are from the same family uh, kind of unit, they can sit together. Otherwise, you have to be six feet apart. You have to wear masks. And we will have hand sanitizer here. And we will have a few other little simple instructions. But nevertheless, Protocols will be in place and you are going to be welcomed back into this space so that we can at least be together for our worship starting next Sunday, the 21st of March. Now, in case you're thinking, well, hey, I don't feel welcome or not welcome, but comfortable and I'm not sure I want to come back to worship, just know this. We will be live streaming the services and after, you can either watch it in real time at at your house or if it turns out you can't watch it right then we will upload it later so that at a later time it'll be on our website and you can watch the service at a time that works for you just so that you know just because we're opening up and we will have in-person worship services doesn't mean we will disappear from being online you still can access our worship that way and we hope that you will be able to do that until you're feeling comfortable enough to come back into the space and join us uh, for worship. One other thing I want to make you aware of, and that is that uh, also this Sunday, the 14th, at 6.30 in the evening, there's going to be a special event, a special service. This service is a COVID-19 kind of one-year retrospective. It's a time where a number of congregations from the St. Paul Area Synod are getting together to do a service to honor uh, those whom we have lost and to pray for those who have been suffering in the midst of this, uh, this pandemic. So this is a whole year that we have faced this pandemic. This service will be an, a really good opportunity for us to reuni be united in prayer uh, together as congregations across the St. Paul Area Synod. You can access that uh, service online by going to the website the ELCA, uh, or excuse me, spas-elca.org. That's the website. If you click on that, you'll find the event for the one year later COVID-19 service. Click on that and it'll take you directly to the Facebook page where the service will be found. So I hope you can join uh, folks in that uh, that kind of commemoration and a time of prayer. Uh, that is 6.30 on, uh, today on, the Mar on March 14th. Those are all the announcements that I need to make right now. I uh, would simply ask that you take a moment to take a deep breath, center your thoughts, your hearts, as we begin our worship time together. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, rich in mercy, through the self-sacrificing love of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for today comes to us from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, starting with verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out to the way on the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, Why have we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you? Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Here ends the reading. The Gospel text that is in front of us for this fourth Sunday in Lent comes to us from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, starting with verse 14. I'd like today to be able to just kind of walk through the text with you. Um, You know, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but on Tuesday mornings at 9 o'clock every week, we've started doing a text study. That means that we talk about the texts that are coming up the following Sunday. And so last Tuesday, we gathered a group of people together and we were talking about the text, both the Old Testament, the text from Numbers, which you've heard, and now the text that you're going to hear from the Gospel of John. And, you know, just like anyone else, when I read these texts, there are certain things that show up in there that I think, oh, I'd like to talk about this. There's so much here. Um, what does this mean for us? What, how can we talk about this in a way that will give us something to hold on to, to take with us in terms of exercising our faith in the week ahead? But what happened this week, which happens from time to time and which is good, is that I found out in listening to the questions that people were asking that really the things I may want to talk about in this text may not be the most important things. And so today, as we walk through the text, I want to lift out the things that I heard uh, from people who were asking questions, and that's where I want to focus some attention. So let me just give you the text. We'll read through it, and this is from John chapter 3, starting with verse 14. If you want to, you can push pause and go get your Bible if you don't have it, and you can follow through, and we can kind of work on this text together, if you will. All right? So here you go. Verse 14, chapter 3. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. 
Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. That's the scripture for today. Whew. I don't know which words kind of stuck out for you, which ideas caught your attention. Clearly, this is that passage that has the most famous Bible verse probably in all the world, John 3.16 right there. And we're going to talk about that in a second because there might be some things there that we haven't really considered before. But I wonder what the words were that stuck out to you. Now, this text, like any text, can only really be understood if it's part of the larger context, if we understand how it fits into the story. And I know I've probably said this before, but I've related the, the comment that any text which is taken out of context is really just a pretext for us to talk about whatever we want to talk about or hear the things we're ready to hear. So in order to get around that, we have to go and listen to the whole story, figure out what the context is so that we can hear more clearly, not just what we want to hear, but what the story, what the, what the verses are trying to tell us about the truth that is there. So just these comments. This is chapter 3 of John, like I said, and it is uh, 11, 12 verses uh, that start out that chapter are really talking about a visit that Jesus and Nicodemus have. Nicodemus and Jesus talk about a lot of things. And they're talking about the fact that what they, Nicodemus is saying what he thinks he knows and what he thinks they, the group of Pharisees and leaders of Jews, know about Jesus. And Jesus kind of comes back at him saying, you know, nobody can really see, nobody can know, nobody can enter this kingdom of heaven or understand it unless they're born of the Spirit which leads us to the whole issue about being born again and all of that. All of these controversies we're going to lay aside. We're going to sort of push them off the table for today and not talk about those. We can talk about them. They're important, but not now. So this is about perception, uh, what people think they know, what people think they see in Jesus, and how they understand what they believe Jesus is doing. And Jesus at the end, by the time he gets to 11, verse 11 says, you really don't understand. How can it be that you are a leader, uh, a teacher uh, in Israel and you do not understand? What I'm telling you is about, has to do with physical things, about human things, fleshly things, and you don't get it. How can you hope to understand the things of heaven, the things about the Spirit that I want to tell you. And after that statement, these verses come. Jesus is now speaking. All of these verses that we read today from verses 14 to 21, these are all Jesus' words to Nicodemus. They are an expansion of, an explanation of who Jesus is and what he means by people coming to him, believing in him. So that's where I want to go with today's uh, scripture uh, and, and sermon, to think about what it means to believe in Jesus, to believe that God has sent him, to believe that what Jesus tells us or asks of us, what does that mean? Because it's, it turns out that that's where some of the questions were really at the heart of this text from other people who were studying and talking about this text with me. They weren't where I was going, but they were the most, what, immediate questions that came to mind. And so that's where we're going to spend some time because I think in hearing these texts, this text and these verses, that might be where you are too. So these verses started out. In verse 14 it says, kind of picks it up in the middle and says, 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, you're probably thinking, what in the world is that, right? Do you remember when the Israelites were in, uh, you know, out in the wilderness, we heard the story, uh, a few of the verses from Numbers 21. Uh, we heard that they were grumbling. The Israelites were grumbling against Moses and grumbling against God. And there's this interesting thing, if you look a little earlier in the text, that says, gosh, uh, you know, God uh, and Moses have brought us out here into the wilderness, and, and there's no food and there's no water. Oh, and by the way, the food is terrible really? So which is it? There is no food or they don't like the food. What are they saying? They're grumbling because they're not happy with what's happened. They're not happy with where they ended up. The kind of food they're stuck with, you know, that little frost-like stuff on the morning that's laying on the t surface of the of the ground. What's that? And how do we know it's going to be there every day? And and these quail that come up once in a while for us to have some meat. I mean, we don't we don't have any control of that. We can't trust any of that. We don't really know that it's coming. We don't like this. Uh, and that's when they say at other times, we'd rather be back in Egypt, back in bondage. You see, you have to think about these uh, Israelites as they're coming out of Egypt. What have they heard from Moses? They have heard these words from Moses. Thus says the Lord that that He's going to lead you out of the of this place. You're going to be taken to a to a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey, you will be brought to the promised land. That's God's promise. Follow me, and we're going to go out of this place and be set free from all of this and come into a land of blessed and promised land. And so they all pack up their bags and follow Moses. And what happens? They get to the Red Sea and they've got this water on one side of them and the armies of Egypt coming on the other side. And right then they think they're going to be washed up. They're going to be killed, right? But God makes a way for them to cross across this Red Sea on dry ground. And wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles, they are free. The Egyptian army is, is lost and they are free and they're able to be in this new land. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. And then they turn around and look at the new land and what is there? Not what they expected. One of the commentators, one of my favorite people, uh, he was a professor of mine uh, back uh, at seminary, Terry Fretheim, who unfortunately just died uh, not long ago. He makes this comment about what the Israelites are, are facing as they come into the promised land. He's saying to them, uh, he says that, what does it mean that they're suddenly facing this, this, per, this, this wilderness? It seems permanent. They're stuck there. And 40 years is a long time in a sandbox. How, how do they get out of here? What are they supposed to make of this promise that they were going to end up in this wonderful land? What does it mean, Fredheim says, for God to create a people out of those who were no people at all? The grandest, he says, of all creative acts, only to leave the rest of the world that he gives them in chaos. In other words, God takes this people, makes of them his people, leads them into this land, but the place he leaves them is in chaos. It's a mess. It's not at all what they were expecting. Again, Fratheim says, the promises have been spoken, but who can live on words alone? The hope has been proclaimed, but the horizon keeps disappearing in the sandstorms. Trust in God turns to recalcitrance and resentment. Faith erodes with the dunes, and judgment is invited to share one's tattered tent. This isn't the kind of salvation or redemption they expected. The redemption now looks pale, unreal. Saved from what for what? We were better off where we were before. It's hard for us sometimes to think about what that must have been like. All we think of but they did get saved and everything was fine. Yeah, but it wasn't that way for a whole generation of people who perished in the wilderness. Look, uh, a simple story. 
my heritage is German Russian. I know that's kind of out of place with all the Swedes uh, in this area, but I'm German Russian. And I come by that, by the fact that in the late 1700s, mid to late 1700s, uh, a number of, of people from uh, Germany emigrated into Russia because Catherine the Great invited people to come and fill up lands that had been had become vacant. Catherine had been fighting many wars and many people were killed, and so now there were abandoned farms around the borderline borderlands in what is now like Kazakhstan and, and Kyrgyzstan and places like that. So anyway, the Germans went and lived there because it was free land, right? Woohoo, it's going to be good. And they could, they could start a new life. But it wasn't long uh, before Catherine needed uh, to fight another war and was beginning to conscript uh, these newcomers, uh, forcing them to be fighting for Russia, a land that really wasn't theirs. And the reason she did this was because she had, um, in the good times, uh, said to all the nobles and those elites, the people who had, who had degrees and the people who had wealth, he, she said, you don't need to fight the wars anymore. And she sought the, the workers, the serfs, the, the, the people who were out in the fields and the rural areas and these newcomers into the land, she made them fight their wars. And the Germans didn't want to do that, so they ran away. They did. They emigrated again, this time many of them to America and some to other places. That, in that late 1700s, is when my uh, great-grandparents came. Uh, uh, they made uh, a journey here uh, to the, to the, you know, to again, find free land. And, uh, it was, you know, my great, great grandparents and, and those people who were emigrating around my great grandparents who emigrated, they kept thinking they were going to a new land, a better place. And what happened when my relatives came to those first of them who settled in North Dakota, uh, they got there late in the season. Uh, it wasn't enough time to build, uh, these little sod huts that were, the sort of standard homes at the time. Winter was coming, it was coming fast. So they had barely enough time to build tiny little shelters. And as a matter of fact, for a while, my great grandfather dug a hole in the ground and took those little horse-drawn wagons that we called buckboards and turned it upside down, Tur took the seat off and turned the buckboard upside down. That was the roof of his home. And he lived in a hole in the ground, cooked by the fire outside. I wonder, how often he must have thought to himself, what kind of a place is this? What have I come to? Could he believe the promises that this could be a new land? Hard. And that takes us to that word believe. How many times did you hear that word believe here? It says here, uh, whoever believes in him in verse 14 uh, could have eternal life, that is believing in the Son of Man. And again, uh, when we get to that, our famous 316, uh, whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Again, in verse 17, uh, we're going to hear, uh, or verse 18, excuse me, those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who do not believe are... Again and again, we see the word believe. What does it mean to believe? For the Israelites... For people like my relatives who, who emigrated in places, believing a promise wasn't just words or ideas. It wasn't some philosophy. It was something they trusted. To believe is to trust, and that's what the word means. In Greek, the word pistao or pistaon, which is what is here in this text many over and over again, um, that the meaning here, to believe God, is to trust in, to have confidence in God. That means to lean into it. Like I've said before, uh, this is not just an idea. It's doing something about it. It's living in a certain way. A way to, to think about this, a mental image of it, is this. Uh, back in the day, there used to be people who would uh, have uh, stretch wires across Niagara Falls, as these, high, these high lines. They would, they would stretch from one end to the other, and they would take a wheelbarrow and push it across the high wire high above Niagara Falls. And more often than not, what this person would do is to go to the crowd and take somebody from that crowd and say, would you be willing to sit in my wheelbarrow as we go across Niagara Falls? Now, the crowd there could say, yes, we believe you can do it. We believe you can do it. And he'd say, okay, get into my wheelbarrow and I'll push you across. You can come with me. What do you think? 
Was it easy to find people to do that? Would you have gotten into that wheelbarrow? Huh? To believe, to trust, to lean into, to have confidence in, is to get into that wheelbarrow and go. Right? That's what this word is about. To believe, to trust in God, in Jesus Christ, in the things that Jesus is telling us. And not just what he's telling us, but in the way he is going to be living. In the way he is. I am the way. It's not just to have uh, faith from a distance. It is to put your confidence in and to go with, to get in that wheelbarrow and go where Jesus is going to take us, to live a different life. Jesus is headed to the cross to be lifted up as that serpent was. The people who were there in the wilderness, bitten by serpents and needing to be saved, they had to look to a pole upon which a, a bronze serpent had been put. And why the serpent? Because when they looked up, they saw two things. Their own sinfulness was revealed. The reason they were suffering, the reason they were in peril was because of their sin. Right there it is on the cross, on the pole. It's that sin that has condemned them. And it's only by looking at that, recognizing it, and trusting in God's promise that now they would be healed, that they come to fullness. But they would look at that and be healed. There in the midst of their wilderness, not when they were delivered, but in the wilderness, God came to them. Even there amidst and in the presence of their enemy, they are saved by God's promise. That's what makes it work. And in that same way, Jesus, the Son of Man, must be lifted up. So that when we look now at the cross, we also see something revealed. Two things, our sin and God's way of salvation. We look at that cross and we see the bloodied, beaten, suffering body of Jesus. And what we must understand first is that that is the result of our sin. It's not a few things that we did. Sinfulness that is loose in the human condition breeds actions that are destructive, hateful, violent. Jesus wasn't coming to forgive my actions of sinfulness or yours. Jesus came to defeat the power of sin and death and evil so that he would take that into himself and in his death the power of those things would die as well. But unless when we see that image of Jesus on the cross, we understand that it is our participation in sin that nails Jesus to the cross. Unless we accept and acknowledge our participation in that, we cannot understand our deep need and our desperate situation that the only hope for us is that the love of God in Jesus, revealed also on that cross, is our way of salvation. A death of someone on a cross does no good unless it's connected to the promise of, G of God. God so loved. In the same way that God loved and saved those people in the wilderness, in that same way, God loved not just you and me, but the whole world. Killed, took away the power of sin and evil for good. But the problem is that these verses say that there are some who believe and some who don't, some who will trust it and live into it, go with that, live now in a different way, realize they don't have to live in fear and in hatred any longer, but can live the power of love and really believe that it can make a difference to open yourself up and be vulnerable, to trust this word of love. That's what it means to believe. Some people will look at that and say it's foolishness. 
It's foolishness because they don't believe that they're guilty of causing that. They're good people. They didn't do that. It happened 2,000 years ago. It has nothing to do with me. And so they, ha they don't want anything to do with it. They don't believe there's a claim on their lives because of that cross, even though there is. Others will look at that cross and feel the weight of their participation and believe, trust, lean onto the promise that is there on that cross, that there is a way open for us to be vulnerable, to open up, to trust love, not hate and fear. That's what this is about. The way of life and love is there for all of us. It's made possible by God in Jesus Christ, but we are not made to believe it. It's up to us to either accept our participation, acknowledge our sinful action participates in the sinfulness that Jesus came to destroy, or we turn away. Which will it be? Hard choices. We make hard choices all the time when it comes to this kind of trusting in love, really. To believe it, to really trust it. Do we believe that love is greater than hate? Light greater than darkness? Or are these just flowery words? Naive sentiments. There's a lot of work to be done. Jesus calls us not to be saved into some glorifying, happy, wonderful blessedness. Joy is ours. Joy is ours. Not necessarily happiness, but joy is ours. And that joy comes from the pouring out of our hearts for those we love and for those who we don't even know even as Jesus lived that way. We have some really hard things to face. We have some difficult things unfolding in the city of Minneapolis, really close by to us. A trial. People raising voices, wanting to be heard, calling for justice, calling for peace, calling for healing calling for accountability, and there's fear and anxiousness. There is all kinds of resistance. It's a hard time. Our actions are called for because we're followers of Jesus. Can we trust love? Love that puts us in a place where we will speak out, where we will give space for others to be heard, whether we agree or not. Will we speak in ways that not just say, I have the right to say I want to say, but take responsibility for the reactions and responsibility for the damage or healing it can do? Rights without responsibilities aren't real. We have to take the chance to believe that the one who died on that cross for us ended the systems of evil, wherever they are, gave us an option to live in other ways just to participate not in fear and anger and all the rest of it, but to trust that there is another way to hear one another, to care for one another. God's love moves toward us to free us, to provide another way for us in the wilderness where we find ourselves emotionally, physically, spiritually. Here in the wilderness, God makes a way. Look up to that one who has been lifted up 
on the pole outside the city of Jerusalem. For you, for me, for the cosmos, for all people. And let us do our own soul searching in these days ahead as to what the call of God is for us, how we live out this love, show our trust and confidence in Jesus by letting him lead the way into conversations with our sisters and brothers, sisters and brothers of color, sisters and brothers who are white, with whom we differ, all of us, we belong to God. And there is a way for us to be human, really human, as God intended. God's love moves first to us and makes the way possible for us to move next. Let us, in the power of the Spirit, go forward. Amen. Once again, I just want to take an opportunity to express my gratefulness to you, to all of you who have been supporting the ministry and mission of Elam Lutheran Church in spite of the pandemic time when we have been apart. I want you to know that because of your giving, the, the, the things that we've been doing, providing the scholarships to students in Tanzania, providing food and supplies to people who are needing to be in the homeless shelter at St. Andrews, and Hugo, the, the things that need to be done have been continuing to be done because you have been willing to support that work. You know that the work and the life of Elam has not ever been closed down. We have continually been about the work we're called to do. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your passion for this ministry. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all of God's creation. Loving God, you came not only to free individuals from habits, addictions, vices, 
but to finally defeat systems of evil, the deep and prevalent orders that seek to control, to contain, and to oppress your people and your whole creation. O oh Lord, grant us courage to look honestly into ourselves and into the world around us, to look up to you and to your cross, to face squarely the truth of our participation, our reason for you being there, and open our eyes that we might see at once the way of love you open for us there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice and mercy, as these days are the unfolding of the trial of Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, we pray that you would be with the family of George Floyd, that you would be with the judge and the jury members, be with the protesters, police officers, and National Guard, and all who gather. May all voices be heard, but without violence or destruction. Bring forth your truth with mercy and justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of promise, as you led your people out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land, so now, Guide the work of Elam's Transition Task Force as we seek to listen to you and to the members of Elam so that together we may discern your leading for our future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing Lord, be with all who have suffered through this COVID-19 pandemic throughout this past year. Comfort those who are grieving, Bring healing to those who are ill. Provide strength to all medical workers and first responders who so diligently have served us, our whole nation, and the entire world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over those within our own community who are in need of healing, whether in mind or body or spirit, we pray for Jeff, for Aaron, Denise and Walter, Taylor, Chris and John. Give comfort to Stephen in the death of his mother. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these things, O oh Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, who was lifted up for us and who taught us to pray. Hi from Parmley. This is Chris Lindbergh and Mignon Johnson. And she has been up here for a year now. And she's doing pretty darn good, aren't you, Mom? Mm-hmm. I am. <laughs> and she just had a birthday. How old are you? 103. <laughs> pretty good. And I'm 72, and I did the math today. And if we said the Lord Prayer, both of us, every day, it would be 61, at least 61,600 times in our life. So we'd like to say it again for you. Our Father, Father who art, art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, as we prepare to leave the spaces we are in, and move into the rest of our day and into the week ahead. Go with this blessing. May the Lord watch over you, bless you, and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with mercy and with grace. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.